Welcome back to Cars Plus. Today we're going to talk about our fully restored Ram Rototiller. If you watched the first video, you saw it when we gave it a sort of unboxing. Now you can see what the Rototiller should look like. And in the video it's going to look like, oh my god, he really made it too nice. But the reality is I didn't take all the dents out of it because we're going to use the Rototiller for what it was intended for. Here we have the Graham Rototiller painted in the correct yellow color, which you can get online and by the exact color it was. To me, it looks like road grader yellow, but this is the correct yellow color that came in. Except, of course, for the wheels, because the wheels are painted in the correct Graham dark blue that they were painted in originally. So you would get your Rototiller, it would be mostly yellow, and the wheels would be dark blue as you can see them now. You'll notice that throughout the rototiller, we have plated most of the hardware. That's because we had to take it apart anyway, put all new seals in it, and since it's going to be a working rototiller for us, I opted for plating the hardware instead of having it painted. Originally, most, if not almost all of the hardware would have just been painted on the rototiller, but I felt plated was better, makes it more serviceable. The carburetor you're looking at here happens to be Part of the who's who of manufacturers back in the day that made parts for the Graham Rototiller. That particular carburetor was made by Tillotson, a very famous name in the carburetor business. Now you're looking at the back of the one cylinder engine on the Graham Page Rototiller. The interesting thing about that engine, that was made by Bell Aircraft. Nowadays you would know it as Bell Helicopter. So a company that made helicopters, and makes them today, made the engine for the Graham Page Rototiller. Now you're looking at the Magneto. Another very interesting thing about the Graham Page Rototiller, that's made by Fairbanks Morse. And of course, Fairbanks Morse has been in business for ages, made everything from scales to train master locomotives to big power plants for ships. And of course, as you can see, they also made magnetos. The same company that made the wheels for our 39 gram also made the wheels for the rototiller. And that was known as the Motor Wheel Company. It was in business for a very long time and went out of business, I believe, in the 1960s. Just an interesting fact, same wheel company for the cars and the rototiller. The tires you're looking at today happens to be a reproduction tire, the same sort of tire was originally, except it doesn't have the name on it it would have had back in the day, because back when the rototiller was built, that would have been a Firestone tire, another big name in the automobile business. We thought you might like to take a look at the patent and data plate that's on the rototiller. This is the real one that was here. Just cleaned up and sprayed clear, and you can see it was made by Graham Page Motors Corporation and all that interesting patent data that's on it. Up front on the rototiller, this particular spot, you would push in and then you would pull the handle. This engages the dog clutch so you can turn the engine over for starting it. Obviously a grease point for that particular item. Over on the side here, this is your choke control for the Rototiller, when you're going to start it, pull the choke out, of course. Here, on this side, and here on this side, these two bolts are for mounting additional items, such as you could get a plow back in the day for one of these. Boy, that'd be a nice thing to find. And we could put a plow on the front. Of course, we could make one up that would fit it, but an original one might be kind of nice to have. This is your crankcase dipstick. That takes care of checking all your oil because it's oiled in the crankcase and forward as well as all the way to the back. And you check your oil here. It's also your filler. You would pull this out. You unscrew the square nut portion of that. And it takes it out and that's where you filled the oil on the rototiller. As you can see, we have fixed our oil bath air cleaner. 
put it back exactly where it's supposed to be. You'll notice there's an oil level marked on it. We're going to put oil in it just before we start it here. Oil bath air cleaner because of course you're going to work in very dusty conditions at times with a rototiller. Now you're looking at the sight glass in the center of the picture located directly below the fuel tank. We had to make a nice new little handle for that. That's your fuel shutoff area. And it also filters your fuel and lets you know if you have fuel flowing into your line to your carburetor. Here we are at the back of the rototiller and I'm holding up the cover part way so you can see the tines under here and the assemblies for them. They've been painted black because I'm going to use this rototiller. Originally they would have been yellow, but the yellow paint that we have put in most of the rototiller is extremely expensive and the black paint is about 10 to 20 percent the cost of the expensive yellow. So we decide we paint those black since they're going to get chewed up as far as the paint's concerned the first time we use the rototiller. Also you'll see that there's a big adjustment bar. We can adjust the height of the entire cover, tying cover there. And then we have another black assembly bar down there that adjusts the height of the rototiller relative to grinding into the surface of the planet. In this case, we've got it still up so that the tines are elevated. That was so we could test rotation by hand. We're going to lower that when we are going to operate the rototiller shortly. As we lower the cover, you can see the instruction panel. That's a reproduction of the instruction panel. The one that was on the rototiller, you could still feel the raised portions, but I could get a reproduction so inexpensive in this case I opted to put the reproduction on but it shows you how your rototiller would have come with all the instructions. Here it says you have a push button. This particular rototiller has a rotational shut off that cuts the power effectively by grounding out your magneto and then you have your various controls here which are above us but it tells you exactly what everything does so you can operate your rototiller. Here's the switch, as I was telling you, effectively your kill switch. On this particular one, it rotates instead of a push button like it says down below. But this is what was on the rototiller when we got it. It works. We have put a brand new wire on it, but that's the only thing we did there, as well as clean it. That works just fine. So this is on. This would be off for the rototiller when we want to shut it down. We have brand new handles that we were able to buy. Originally, the handles would have been rubber covered, but... They don't make rubber covers for them. I thought about dipping them, but the reality is, is that's only going to last a few years. So I decided let's opt for leaving them wooden and putting on linseed oil to protect them. So that's what's been done. So you got nice big handle grips here. You have the rest of your controls as we showed you what they do down below. Your throttle is over here. Your wheel speed control is here. Your horizontal handlebar control is here. Your vertical handle control is here and your tiller on and off is here. Now what does it mean by horizontal and vertical? Let's show you. If we look down here in the center, you can see that there are teeth. So we can change the position of these handlebars to a whole bunch of different positions vertically. You'll also see there are teeth down here horizontally. We can do the same thing. You can walk beside this rototiller on either side or you can walk behind the rototiller. It made a noise. It fired. It fired. <laughs> that was something.
this point in the video, you've already seen that the rototiller runs, but it is a fog machine. It makes so much smoke, it's incredible. We actually had somebody pull off the highway, come up in here and think that maybe there was a forest fire going on. At first we thought, hey, maybe the rings in this machine are no good because we hadn't changed them out, but that's not what's wrong. What's wrong is this particular brand new oil seal. These oil seals are sold for the rototiller. The original seals are no longer available. So we're using this seal, which is recommended by the person who has Fraser Rototiller parts online. It's also recommended by another website as being the seal to use. However, what we found out is this is probably, from what I, my research, a New Holland tractor PTO or power takeoff seal. And supposedly you just put it in, and we'll show you where it's supposed to go in, and where it's been in, and that is right over here. This seal goes in this hole right here. And what should happen is this smooth face right here goes towards the piston, which would be in the case here. Here's our piston and our cylinder block, etc. Well, it goes that way so that the oil seal, which is a lip seal right here, is working towards the oil side. This is the transmission side. I'm pointing up. That would be where the transmission or oil is. Now, a lip seal has to seal on a very tiny lip. Originally, the seal pressed onto the shaft here, and it had the lip on the outside and was sealing against the case. This one, you're supposed to just push it in the hole, get this edge here, even right here, and it's supposed to stay there, and it would be lip sealing on the shaft. Well, guess what? We've had it apart. This is now the third time the seal will pop out this way. So there's either enough pressure generated in the crankcase or, and because it's two-stroke, there is some pressure because we're pressurizing and shoving into our cylinder, or it's just that the thing isn't quite enough to have a fit and hold it there. And as you notice, this is all rubber. Usually you're used to this type of item as being steel and you would press it in and it would have a rubber insert, but it would have a steel piece that would press in there and it wouldn't come out. So we're faced with the reality it comes out. How are we going to solve it? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to silicone it in, but that doesn't seem to me like that's enough. So what I've done is I've created a seal holder, which we'll go back and show you that now. Here is the seal holder that I've come up with. Now I've punched this out using a hydraulic punch set that I've got from Harbor Freight and also a hand punch set for making the holes on the sides. What we've got here is 40 thousandths brass. I think that's going to be adequate. And my ears are soldered on, and you'll notice they have a little reverse bend I've done in them, because if you remember looking at that case, that machined off surface is a little below the casting, so I wanted to have pressure against the seal. We've got both holes here done for 1032 screws, which are stainless steel that we've got here. And then we've got a couple of washers. Washers are not stainless, that's why I'll pick up with my slightly magnetic screwdriver. But this seal mechanism is now going to be held in place physically besides being glued in with silicone. So hopefully it's not going to come out again because when it comes out, it comes this way, all the oil from the transmission goes into the crankcase for the engine and comes up onto the side where the exhaust and intake are and throws it all over the place, makes a huge mess and tremendous amounts of smoke. We don't want that anymore. Now besides that, I'm going to clear silicone this I'm also going to use Loctite on my two screws, just in case. And let's go back over and look at the case for a moment. On each side down here, I have drilled into the case. And one thing to notice, right here on the side, there is a gusset here and there is a gusset here. I have put those holes where the gusset is so that I wasn't going to miss the metal. So those holes are where the gusset is. And those are the two holes I then tapped 1032. They were drilled extra long, tapped 1032, and then I have short screws so that I didn't break off the tap in there and I could definitely screw the device down. And you notice I have not violated the integrity of the place because I have put it, as I said, into these gussets so I was sure that I was in the case itself when I was making this modification. And I hope, sincerely, that this solution of putting my brass ring in there will keep that seal in place so that it will keep the oil 
in the transmission and not going into the crankcase below the engine. First of all, we're going to take our silicone and we're going to put it around this edge completely. So we're going about this more than one manner. I think given the troubles that this, I had this apart two times already, this is the third time at trying to stop this. Both the other times, I, did, I just put the seal back because that's what the instructions were, and that does not work. So now we're getting real serious. So we put, in this case, clear silicone all the way around. doesn't matter what color we're using, just have, so I have clear. And we're going to push it down so it is even with this area. And that looks like we pretty much got it in there. Next thing we're going to do is wipe our hands off so we don't get silicone everywhere. Now I should mention that I cleaned that entire area down in there with pre-clean, which is a paint cleaner, over and over because of course there's been oil in here, using cotton swabs to get rid of all the oil before we silicone that piece in. Now we're going to take our ring, there's our seal retainer, and we're going to set it in there. And when I originally drilled this, I'm going to make sure, because it's probably not 100% even, it probably has to go one way, so give me a moment, make sure which side has to go where. When I did this originally, because I said these were probably not 100% even, I drilled, I put it in here, center punch, drilled one side, completely finished it, fastened it down, then did the other side so it would fit. But as you noticed, it only fits one direction. Now we're going to take a washer. And we're going to put a washer on here. And then we're going to take our blue Loctite and we're going to start our screw in there with blue Loctite on it. I'm not going to use a Loctite that I would have to heat up if I ever need to take this out. Because again, although I think this is probably the solution, this is also still experimental until we prove that it works. And this is one of those cases I almost wish I'd kept the original seal. But it seemed like everything on the rototiller was leaking. I'm going to leave that a little bit loose yet. And then we'll do the other side too. Same routine, putting the Loctite on it. You know, and you think you have all this room and I still feel like my fingers are awful big for it. There we go. So now both sides are started. Get this to screw down all the way. There you have it. The seal retainer is in place. The seal is below it. And the seal is glued in with silicone at the same time. Next time you're going to see this, we'll see if this actually works. And we no longer have a major fog machine. We're back with the rototiller again. You've already watched our solution to the issue with it throwing oil because the seal wouldn't stay in place. We believe we have fixed that problem and today we're going to show you a couple of things with it. Attempt to start it, which I must say seems to be fairly hard, but that's what other people said about them. Once it's running, runs beautiful and we're going to rototill a section for you. It's also a section we want to start with in redoing the driveway area. Let's talk about a couple of things that have been done to it though. The throttle earlier in the video you saw was reversed. Well the reason it turned out to be reversed is we had cleaned the carburetor but we didn't take it apart. You know piece by piece. It turns out our predecessor had one piece on the carburetor backwards that's now been reversed and the throttle works properly according to close here open here just like our panel on the rototiller says it should be. Next thing, this is your tiller clutch control that I've got a hold of. This particular piece tends to fall forward too much. I've got to figure out a way to make it not do that because it likes to turn on the tines just from vibration. And so far I don't have a good solution for that, but we'll work on that in the future right now. I've just got to remember I've got to keep it back when I don't want the tines operating. The center to control whether we want to pivot either up or down or side to side. 
So those don't matter to us because I'm going to leave it in the position it's in. This control over here is currently in neutral, so I could just move the rototiller. That's basically the center position. If we were to push it forward, it's going to go fast. If we pull it back, it goes slow. Slow is plenty fast enough for rototilling. And over here is our kill switch. In this position, we're set to run the rototiller. If we put it straight up, that's going to kill the rototiller. All right, we have our kill switch in the on position. As we told you, up would be to kill it. We don't want to kill it right now. So we've got it in the on position there. Over here at our throttle, we're going to open it just a little. Now, I haven't run it enough to know what's right, so I've opened the throttle just a little bit. We'll see if that's going to work. We've already got our tiller control pulled all the way back, and we are supposedly, it looks like, yes, we're in neutral with our control over here. Next thing we have to do is we have to turn on our gas. You always have to shut the gas off in this thing when you're done, because otherwise it'll just keep flowing down into the carburetor, I found. So I always shut the gas off. We'll turn it on right here. And we can see the gas is flowing and see there's some little junk. It's lucky there is a filter in here. So even though we clean the gas tank, there's a little rust in it still. So now we've got our gas flowing. Now we're going to pull our choke out. We'll probably only do that for one or two tries. Up front here is where you've got to press in. So you pull on your handle, press in, and when it, the dog clutch takes hold, you'll see it's holding it in. Now you're ready to pull on the road tiller and see if it'll start and it takes a hell of a pull okay we're going to shut that off oops good hold oh damn it didn't stay I thought we were done. Yep. Now it's probably going to be a pain. Well, almost again. 